What's up guys, it's Chris Majestic, and today I wanna to talk about something that I think a lot of people don't talk about enough, and that's how to choose a home theater receiver. So instead of simply telling you exactly which home theater receiver to buy, I'm gonna give you some general info so you can choose based on your own requirements and limitations. Now, I was originally gonna start this out by saying that your budget was the first thing to consider when choosing a receiver, but your budget is determined by everything else, so technically this comes last. The main thing I need you to understand is that there are reasons why cheap home theater receivers are cheap, so today I'm gonna to explain why you should stay away from them. Now, of course you have home theater in a box systems, which are usually pretty cheap and come with both a receiver and speakers, and these are okay if you're on a super tight budget, but they only sound slightly better than a sound bar, so I don't usually recommend them. So one thing that has a pretty big impact on your budget is the number of speakers you plan on using. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into the basics since I talked about this in the home theater audio tutorial, but if you plan on running more than five speakers and a subwoofer, then you have to make sure that you get a receiver that supports the additional channels. So if you want a 7.1 setup, you have to buy a receiver that has seven channels, which is usually a 7.2 channel receiver. And if you want something like Dolby Atmos, you need to make sure that the receiver not only supports Dolby Atmos, but that it also supports the number of channels that you need. So for example, if you plan on running a 5.1.2 setup, which is basically a typical 5.1 setup with the additional two overhead Atmos speakers, then you need a receiver that has at least seven channels, so you look for a 7.2 channel receiver. Any additional speakers you add would increase this number, so if you wanted four Atmos speakers, then you would need a 9.2 channel receiver, so of course this number just keeps going up from there. So once you know the exact setup you want and know the exact number of speakers, then you have to pick out some speakers. It's important to choose speakers before you buy a receiver or at least have an idea of what type of speakers you want so that you know what wattage is required to power them. Now this is where things get a little complicated and a lot of subjectivity comes in, so I'm gonna try to keep this as simple as possible. As a general rule of thumb, it's always best to have a receiver or amplifier that's too powerful. There are a few reasons for this, but the general idea is that clipping is what usually damages speakers, and trying to power a set of speakers with a receiver or amplifier that's underpowered will result in clipping, which not only sounds bad, but can destroy your speakers. So for example, if you have a set of floor speakers that can handle 80 watts of continuous power or RMS, then it would be best to buy a receiver or amplifier that has a minimum of 80 watts RMS per channel, but ideally you would want this number to be higher to allow for more headroom and make up for manufacturers who inflate their wattage claims, which I'll talk about in a second. All right, so now you're probably thinking, okay, so I just need to make sure that the RMS rating of my receiver is higher than my speakers, right? Well, no. Unfortunately, it's not that simple because of marketing trickery. So when you're looking at home theater receiver power ratings, you typically see one or more wattage ratings. You might see maximum wattage, which in every case you could completely ignore, or in some cases you might see RMS or continuous power. Well, continuous or RMS wattage is the number you need to focus on, but there are a few other important things to consider about this number. First, you need to know exactly how many channels were used to come up with that number. So as you can see here, this receiver says it does 120 watts per channel with two channels driven. So in a perfect world, this will mean that this receiver can deliver a clean 120 watts to each speaker if only two speakers are used. The problem is in a home theater, you're using more than two speakers, so this number will be lower once you add the rest of the speakers in your setup. The other important piece of information we need to know is the total harmonic distortion, or THD. Now, I'm not gonna go super deep into this because it can get pretty complicated. If you're interested in learning more about THD, then Gene over at Audioholics has some fantastic videos explaining this, but the thing to keep in mind is that the general rule of thumb is that the lower the THD, the better your chances are of getting the distortion-free sound up to the wattage that the manufacturer specifies. Now, I normally recommend a receiver with no more than 0.05% of THD, but depending on your budget, then 0.1% might be okay, since that's usually close to the point where you can start to hear distortion from the receiver. All right, guys, so I'm sitting here editing this video, and I completely forgot the third thing that you need to look for when you're looking at wattage rating, and that's ohms. So sometimes you might see a manufacturer show a certain wattage at six ohms or four ohms, and it's important important to look for eight ohms if you're using an eight ohm speaker, because otherwise it's gonna look like that receiver is more powerful than it actually is. And if you are using a speaker that's lower than eight ohms, then you wanna make sure you're getting a receiver that can handle less than eight ohms. All right, so now let's go ahead and jump right back into the video.
Again, I know this sounds really complicated, so I'm gonna explain this using a real world example. So let's say you wanna set up a 5.1 system and your main speakers have an RMS rating of 80 watts and you have about $500 to spend on a receiver. So you head on over to Best Buy's website and the first receiver you see happens to be the cheapest. It's a Yamaha 5.1 channel 4K home theater receiver. You scroll down to find the wattage rating and oh my God, it does 145 watts RMS. That's perfect since that's more than enough for my 80 watt speakers, right? Well, no, not only is this price way too cheap for these kind of numbers, but we also need a few more pieces of information. Remember the two things that are most important are the number of channels the receiver can deliver the RMS wattage to and the total harmonic distortion. Now on Best Buy's website, it doesn't show how many channels were driven for their claimed 145 watts, but it does show the total harmonic distortion, which is a whopping 10%. This is obviously an attempt to inflate the wattage rating and trick you into thinking it's more powerful than it is. Is. Now, Yamaha isn't the only brand who does stuff like this with their low end equipment, so this isn't a knock on Yamaha. Raising the THD beyond 0.1% is a marketing tactic that manufacturers use to inflate their wattage ratings. I'm not sure of the actual wattage number, but I guess the actual power rating of this receiver with minimal distortion will probably be somewhere in the realm of 60 watts per channel. So usually the easiest way to find out this information is to use Crutchfield's website. So if we Google the model number of the receiver and put Crutchfield after it, the first Google result is usually the product page on Crutchfield, and there it is, the RXV385. So if we scroll down under power, we see 70 watts per channel into eight ohms at 0.09% THD with two channels driven. All right, so 70 watts isn't terrible, but it's clearly not the 145 watts they claimed on Best Buy's website. So 0.09% THD is pretty much the same as the 0.1% that I mentioned earlier, but notice it's 70 watts with two channels driven. Now, obviously most home theaters have at least five channels. In a 5.1 setup, your main speakers usually require the most power, but your other speakers do require some wattage, so it's better to get a receiver with more wattage. So since we have 80 watt main speakers, I would suggest just getting a receiver that produces at least 100 watts with two channels driven, which would give us some extra power for your center channel and surround speakers. All right, so let's say you were to buy the Yamaha receiver anyway. If you were to connect it to your speakers and turn it up to reference volume, you will be sending a good amount of distortion to your speakers that would not only sound horrible, but it would eventually destroy them. Believe it or not, it would be better to send 100 watts of clean sound to an 80 watt speaker than it would be to send 70 watts of distorted sound. So now that we understand some of the marketing tactics that these manufacturers use on their low price receivers, let's try to find one that would be a better fit. So if we continue scrolling down the list, we see a Denon X2700H that claims to do 95 watts times seven channels. Now $900 is clearly higher than our $500 budget, but let's just take a look. So we're not even gonna bother looking at Best Buy specs. Let's go ahead and jump straight over to Crutchfield. So we see that indeed it does 95 watts per channel at 0.08% THD with two channels driven. Now ideally we need at least 80 watts per channel to each of our main speakers, but we still have our center channel and surround speakers. While those extra few watts might just be enough to drive those other speakers during a movie, so the receiver might work fine for your setup as long as you're not trying to play music at full volume through all five of your speakers at once. Now honestly, I'd still recommend getting something a little more powerful, but this will work okay for most people. So considering how much we had to spend just to power a pair of 80 watt speakers, what happens if you had a much bigger budget and we had some main speakers that could handle 200 watts each, a center channel that could handle 120 watts, and what if we wanted to do a 7.1.4 Dolby Atmos setup? So considering the amount of power we need with this setup, this is where I would usually recommend a dedicated amplifier since the built-in amplifiers in most mid-range home theater receivers don't put out that kind of power. So in order to use an amplifier, you need a receiver that has pre-outs. This would essentially turn your receiver into what's known as a processor since it's being used to process the audio and then passes the raw sound to the amplifier. So pre-outs usually consist of RCA or XLR outputs on the back of your receiver for each of the speaker channels. Now, unfortunately, the Denon X2700H that we looked at earlier doesn't have pre-outs, but the X3700H does. So if we look at the back of the X3700H, we see a whole pre-out section, which consists of RCA outputs for front, center, surround, surround, back, and height channels. So even though this is a nine channel receiver, it can actually process 11 channels, which is exactly what we need for 7.1.4 Dolby Atmos setup. 
And while we're looking at the X3700, let's see how many watts it can handle. So if we go over to Crutchfield, we see that it does 105 watts with two channels driven. So this isn't anywhere close to what we need for our 200 watt speakers. So just out of curiosity, what if we had a $4,000 budget to spend on a receiver? Well, this is the X8500H, which is Denon's current flagship receiver. And if we look this up on Crutchfield, we see that it does 150 watts at 0.05% THD with two channels driven. Now this is pretty good, but believe it or not, we can actually do much better with a dedicated amplifier and we can spend even less money. So I'm personally a fan of Emotiva amplifiers since they make great quality amps and I trust their power ratings. So if you're trying to spend the least amount of money but still get the best bang for your buck when it comes to wattage, what you could do is get a three channel amplifier and power your main speakers and center channels with that and then use the receiver's built in amplifier to power your surround speakers since they don't need that much power. So you could grab something like the Emotiva XPA3, which is a three channel amp that delivers 275 watts at 0.1% THD with all three channels driven. So this is way more than enough to drive your 200 watt main speakers and even allows you to send up to 275 watts to your center channel speaker if you need it. So as you can see, an amplifier can give you a lot more wattage and flexibility, but most importantly, it makes your speakers sound better. Now beyond wattage, of course, there are other features to consider when you're looking for a receiver. One of the most important things to look at is HDMI versions and support. Considering that HDMI is gonna give us the best sound quality for movies and TV shows, it's super important to make sure that the receiver you choose supports the latest and greatest HDMI versions so you don't have any issues with getting the best video and sound from your Blu-ray player, streamer, or game console. The next thing I wanna talk about is room correction. So most mid-range home theater receivers come with some sort of room correction software and a calibration microphone. This allows you to connect the microphone to your receiver, place the microphone in multiple seating locations locations in your room and let the receiver calculate and correct the sound from your speakers to match the acoustics of your room. But the thing to consider when choosing a receiver is that the more expensive receivers typically have better room correction. This might not seem like a big deal, but it makes a pretty big difference in the sound you get from your speakers. Now to be fair, you can use an app or your phone or other tools to accomplish the same goal, but it does help to have it built into the receiver. Another thing to consider is the number of HDMI ports the receiver has. Now most modern receivers have at least five or six HDMI ports, which is usually more than enough for most people, but it is best to double check that you don't have too many devices. And if you plan on sending video to more than one TV, then you need to make sure that the receiver has more than one HDMI output. This can be helpful for people who wanna run both a TV and a projector. And last but not least, the next thing to consider are zones or smart home features. So multiple zones allows you to use one receiver to power and control a completely different set of speakers in another location. And smart home features allow you to stream music and control your receiver from other devices. This would include things like Apple AirPlay, network support, home automation, and app control. Now, honestly, I don't really use any of those features, but they might be important to some people. All right, guys, I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully I was able to give a few people a better understanding of home theater receivers and how to choose one. Now, of course, I didn't cover every possible situation considering there are so many variables and home theater is highly subjective, but this was meant to be used as a general guide. But either way, I wanna get you guys thoughts on this, so go ahead and give me your experience and comments in the comment section. If you did find this video helpful, go ahead and make sure you mash that like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.